All right, welcome back everybody. We are going to be moving into a new unit today, Unit 8, and the topics for this unit are uh, web development as an overview of the whole development process. Um, we're going to look at uh, e-commerce. Uh, we're going to look at some uh, you know, marketing strategies for working on the web, including SEO, and some advanced CSS techniques, uh, including uh, working with what they call Flex, and I know we've looked at that briefly in the previous weeks, but that actually comes on the table, I think, as, a, as an uh, extra credit assignment this week. I do have some pre-recorded videos from prior semesters, uh, but I do plan on recording fresh ones. Uh, you can see the last time I taught this class, for whatever reason, my chapters 12 and 13 didn't render, um, and they, they, I don't know, the videos got corrupt or whatever, and they never even made it up there. So my old chapter 12 and 13, those are pretty old. And I, I don't think that these links even work actually anymore. Um, anyhow, so I'm probably going to end up disabling that second listing. So I will be creating all new videos. And I'm not sure if I'll make separate ones for each chapter. I guess we'll figure that out as we, we kind of go. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about today is just kind of an overview, not of actually coding per se, but of the whole process of doing development work. And this is a, a topic that will probably repeat itself in all of your coding classes one way or another, depending on who your instructors are. Um, but this chapter here is kind of, I, I look at this one as kind of like a direct connection to one of the last courses you're gonna take, which is our web project management class. When you get all the way through your two-year degree, and ideally in your last semester, you'll take a course called uh, web uh, web developer project, I think they call it now, where you actually build a real website for a real client. So you're not going to be making like pretend websites, you're making one that actually goes out on the internet that people can really see. And it becomes a portfolio piece for you at the end. And I'll tell you what, a lot of times uh, just the work in that one class is enough to land people a job. Uh, it often does. And um, when you get to that class, one thing we teach you is not, not only how to pull off doing a real project, but all the techniques that are involved with working with teams. And the, the way that you really learn about working with a team is by actually working with a team. <laughs> you know, what, what a concept. Uh, but there are actually methodologies to doing development work, uh, some of which are classic and some of which are evolving. Uh, but they do have um, a lot of information in Chapter 10 about it. So I'm pulling down the PowerPoint right now and I'm going to be uh, lecturing over that PowerPoint. You can do the same follow along uh, or whatever you want to do. All right. There's not a huge number of slides in here, so this should go somewhat quick. Depends on how long winded I get, but I do want to make sure that you have a firm grasp of the concepts. Um, and it's not so much that you're going to be heavily tested on this or anything like that. Not that there's like a lot of coding work that goes into this chapter. But it is really important when you start doing development work that you understand that when you do it professionally, there's techniques and methodologies that are applied to the process. All right, the, the learning objectives for this uh, chapter are the ones listed here. So we're looking at, uh, you know, not to read these to you exactly, but you know, what kind of things are involved in actually doing this kind of work? What kind of job roles are involved in web development work? Is it just like this one guy that sits in a dark closet and sits there and codes the whole time and does nothing else? Uh, no, there's a lot more to it than that, and, and hopefully this chapter will kind of open that up. You'll look at what we call uh, f the formal system development life cycle, which has kind of been the project approach really over you know, the last half century or so uh, in getting project work done, um, and still very much an active approach. Uh, there are some more modern uh, methodologies for doing project work, too, that we see out in the field, you know, things like Agile, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that briefly, too. Um, and then it, we want to, like, also look at how these project approaches apply to web development work, because web development projects can be a little bit different than traditional software projects in a lot of different ways. And um, we'll kind of step through the entire procedural approach of it. Not that we're going to really employ it in this class, but so you, that you have an overview if you start going out into the field or maybe if you start doing freelance work on the side as you're going towards your degree, that you have an approach that you can use that might work for you. 
And um, we're also going to do a, a little bit of an overview of what domain names and hosting are. And those, I think, are very uh, useful pieces of information. And I always look at this particular chapter in the book as, like I said, kind of a, an overview of what you kind of cover when you get to that project class at the end of your degree. So when we, you get to that class, that class is all about this chapter, basically. It's not just the coding, it's actually doing the project and, and how you approach it. So we get really deep into all these topics. One of the reasons I, I take chapter 10 out of sequence is uh, a number of different reasons. I think it pairs up better with the topics in chapters 12 and 13. Uh, so that's why we kind of we went from 9 to 11, and now we're going back to 10. So we still are hitting all the chapters in the book, so please make sure you read it. I think the author does a very nice job of explaining um, a lot of these concepts. And, and like all other technology topics, there's lots and lots of information out on the Internet about this stuff as well um, that you can research on your own. All right, let's talk about um, kind of the, the fundamentals here about looking at, at project work. Um, all right, first of all, when you get together and you start working professionally in this field, you might either take a couple of different approaches. The one approach is you will freelance. And that's like, that was my predominant approach to making money off of this stuff, is I would take on uh, projects from paid clients or unpaid clients. Um, sometimes the client was myself, you know, because I, I operated some businesses in the past and I um, would build websites for those businesses. You know, why not? Who else, you know, why would I hire somebody else to do it when I can do it myself? Um, but if you do the role entirely yourself, and this is what freelancers often fall into, is they end up wearing all the hats that you see here themselves. You know? And it really makes you not only a full stack developer, but an IT generalist on top of it all. Um, but if you are working on a project team, so if you go to a professional company, so it could be a big corporation that has um, a marketing or a web department that does this kind of work, or a development team that does application development for the web, or whatever the, that company does. You will typically work on project teams. You'll have a grouping of people, could be anywhere from a couple to a dozen or several dozen people that are on a project team. And when you get into a project team, you're going to find that people are broken down into like specific tasks because that's just kind of what they do, or they're really good at it some really common titles. Like if you were sitting around a table at a big development firm, you would probably have one person that's, well, the boss, right? <laughs> or, or the person that's tasked with making sure that whatever project you're working on, whatever your team is working on, he's kind of overseeing it and making sure that it's staying on track and, and trying to hit the target or you know, basically fulfill the contract usually is what it is or whatever obligation you have to the company you're working for. But you'll have all these other job roles. So you notice here, um, where in all of this is the web developer way at the bottom of the list? So what, it, what this is really telling you is that when you're building a web application or a website professionally, the coding part of it is just one aspect of the whole overview of the project. It is not the entirety of the project. And that's the one mistake that we make as coders is we, well, everything revolves around the code, so we're all important, right? No, you're wrong. That's not the way it works. You really have to look at it from a much higher level. So your project manager usually is the one that's tasked to look at it from that overview level. But you will pull in all sorts of different expert, expertise into your project team. So for example, aside from a manager, look at all the things that are listed here. So we have an information architect. Well, if you build an application that connects to a database or requires the building of a database, you might have somebody in your organization that thinks about all the data that the organization uses and stores and manipulates and generates and how your application might need specific access to certain aspects of it and, and how that will be built out. And you know, that, that's a pretty high level function. You also have people that will, are what we call user experience designers. Those are people that think about how the application looks and behaves, 
you know? Like when you go to like the Facebook website, you know, and I always use this one kind of as an example, so I'll just pull up a browser here quick and, and just go to Facebook, right? And I know I've done this plenty of times in this class. I, you know, I bring up the interface and, you know, somebody is thinking about like, okay, if I just type Facebook.com, where does that take me? What does it look like? Why does it look like this? How is this like functionally different than going to like, you know, maybe a, a news website like this, another one that I always use as, as an example. How is it functionally different? Well, this one is like loaded with tons of information, right? And lots of categories and menus and options. And then you go to Facebook and it's kind of like, well, I guess I'm either I'm logging in or I'm signing up, right? And there's a lot of thought that goes into developing these interfaces. In fact, I think the companies that spend time thinking about their interfaces and trying to make sure that their users can figure out what they're doing on the screen are the ones that tend to succeed when they create applications. I mean, I bet you guys have run into pieces of software either where you're working or even here at school or whatever, and you go, well, this software sucks. <laughs> You might even say that about some of your instructor's course shells, honestly. I, don't, I mean, I don't know how everybody does theirs. I mean, I know how people in our department do their course shells, and I think the web people tend to be better than the other instructors, honestly. Um, and you really notice a difference, like, if you start taking, like, an English class, and they run it, like, a completely kind of different way, you know, where I, I think of my Blackboard shell as a website, and I don't want you guys to have to click more than once or twice to get to something. What always drives me crazy is I have to go to a website and I have to click and then click again and then click again and click again to get to that one dumb thing. Why couldn't I just click once or just have, better yet, why don't you just put it on the screen for me, right? And so what I think is really kind of powerful about looking at like this Facebook interface is that they've identified what is it I'm doing on the site? Well, I'm either logging in or signing up. It's like one or the other. It, or option number three, I'm out of here, right? I didn't mean to type Facebook. I meant to type football, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so that there's a significant amount of thought that's given to the user experience. And user experience designers can often extend beyond the screen, too. That's what, it's really kind of funny. Have you ever, like, even looked, like this cup of coffee I have sitting here on the desk, right? Somebody thought about... It's like, well, why do we have sleeves on a cup of coffee? Well, because it's hot. I don't want to burn my hand. Well, somebody thought about the user experience of like, doesn't it suck when you get a cup of coffee to go and it's burning your hand? So that's why they developed the sleeve. You know, doesn't it suck when you're drinking an open cup of coffee in the car and you're spilling on yourself? That's why they developed the cover. Those are user experience things also. Those types of thoughts do extend to the screen. And like I said, if you do that well, you can really make people very happy with whatever thing you're designing or building. Like for example, you know, um, like the Macintosh user interface, right? They were so far ahead of Windows. They, were, they had a graphical user interface that's functionally almost identical to what they have now back in 1984. Took Windows over a decade to catch up. Over a decade to catch up. And to this day, the people that are hooked on a Mac platform hate Windows. They, they think it's clunky looking, it doesn't operate well, it's not intuitive. And of course, PC users that go over to the Mac go, I don't understand where anything is. This makes no sense, right? Um, but they have put a lot of thought into that user experience design from a real early phase. And you know, think about the user experience design. I remember the days when they came out uh, when, when Microsoft Office was kind of a new thing, and they came out with that little helper dog that would jump up on the screen. It's like, who, who thought of that, right? And now it's like, almost, it's like, a, like, like a meme joke on, online even, you know, to the point where my kids are pointing out, hey, remember Clippy? You know, and, and I'm like, what, what's Clippy? Oh yeah, the paperclip guy, helper in Microsoft Word that nobody used, right? The first thing you did is like, how do I turn this thing off? Right, that was like your, fir your first goal. All right, so. Even big companies don't get this right, but companies that do get it right, and I think one company that does, I think, is Google. So like, if you go to like a Google website, well, I have a background on mine, but Google's got it right, because what are you doing on Google? Search, <laughs> you know, I mean, so that's front and center. 
or you're maybe logging into your account and your Gmail and your apps, right? So that's kind of up in the corner and it's secondary. But they have people, and I'll tell you what, user experience designers are amongst the highest paid people on this list. That's kind of weird, right? And there's people that walk around at organizations like Google and they do a lot of their design work on pencil and paper, on a whiteboard, post-its, <laughs> drawing things out. It's totally a career path. And if you're really interested in that career path, it can be a very profitable one. It takes a little bit of uh, further study. We teach some aspects of this in the program, but it's, that's not our primary focus. Um, but I always do like to point it out. I, I did have a lot of experience teaching at an art school and some other uh, institutions where that was much more primary to uh, the programs at those institutions than it was here. And that's usually when you take more of an artistic approach. So it kind of crosses over into the graphics area. Because you know when you're doing design of anything, there are certain best practices, just like there are with coding. And, and some of those skills are very learnable. Another thing that we put on project teams are marketing people. Why? Well, for a lot of organizations, the web has now become the primary marketing platform. I look at the way that Gateway advertises, right? In the old days, if you would advertise anything, Let's say we step back 50 years, the first thing you'd think of is newspaper. And then if you could afford it, TV and radio, right? And now, like, nobody advertises in the, in the newspaper. Well, some people still do, right? Some people buy the newspaper just to get the coupons, right? I mean, that, I mean that's kind of a thing. But marketing on the web is primary. Marketing through social media is really important. But having somebody that thinks about you know, how you're putting your image out there, the branding, the logo, the colors. Like Gateway, for example, has very specific colors that they use. I don't know if you notice it, but even the colors we paint our walls and the carpets and the logos and all the stuff that you see is all from a pre-selected palette. And that's all chosen by the marketing department. They have a campaign. Like when you log into the desktops here, and it, what, what does it say on the desktop? Like, life is big, you know, I don't know, pay us money and learn something. Something like that. Uh, they, have, they always have some slogan, logo, uh, slogan or something they're operating on, and I, I think it's fascinating. So they, they create like an identity. Then you have these other people called copywriters and editors. So you know what? When words go on the screen on a website, they're really important. And one of the, one of the old mistakes that we used to see in a lot of like more primitive website development is people would create these beautiful looking websites, but they couldn't compose an English sentence. So you will actually have specialized people at organizations who are called exactly that, copywriters. What's copy? The words that go on the screen. What is it we're saying about our organization? You, just, you don't want some hack that can barely code typing up like what your know, organization is about. You're probably going to have somebody in a pretty important prominent position making sure that every word is in the right place, like your mission statement or something. You know, because how you present yourself really makes a difference. Um, and then you also have people that, that will oversee those copywriters called editors at, that are even at a higher level. Do you think like, you know, some of these examples that I'm looking at here, like, like the BBC, you think that they don't like check, double check, recheck, edit this stuff like backwards and forwards before it goes out there? Absolutely. They're really careful about the words that they use and, and, and choose. And if this is a news site, right? If you're a company pitching your services, it becomes even more important because really what you're doing is you're, you're creating an identity. If the web is kind of like the, the, the front most facing format that people are looking at first, and, and I would argue that if you're a business of any sort, of any size, you're not even considered real until you're on the web, right? It's like, oh, you got a new you know, restaurant? Or what's your website? We don't have one yet. Well, you're not really a restaurant then, are you? You probably don't even make food <laughs> as far as we're concerned. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the mindset. But how you put yourself out there really helps. And, and I'm going to tell you from a little bit of experience, I discovered from doing some business websites and other websites that if you put really effective wording and, and in some cases verbose descriptions of whatever you're selling or pitching 
on your website, that can be the difference into making the sale or keeping the person looking at your website and participating in whatever you're doing. I don't know if you've ever gone to a website, and like, like if you're shopping for anything, and you're like, well, that, that's great, but they don't say anything about it. All right, this is, I'm going somewhere else, right? Or if you go to like a site where they have tons of information about whatever it is you're looking up, you're much more apt, especially if it's done well, to stay there. And so kind of related to that is you have these people that kind of oversee the content. They work kind of closely with all of them. And content managers will look at everything from like the words on the page to the images to the, um, you know, what, what's on what page. Is it like something in an image gallery or is it just a blurb or, or whatever. You also will have graphic designers. Often some of these roles for some of these people can be combined too, so keep that in mind. But if you're really lucky and you get on a project team and every once in a while and in the web program I get students that have already like have like bachelor's degrees in graphic design or are concurrently taking the graphics program here on campus. And when you get those people into like project groups, it's like, all right, we have somebody that knows how to work Photoshop and Illustrator and create really cool logos and um, you know what, and those are skills folks. I've seen, I've seen people, uh, you know, by virtue of teaching at the Art Institute where somebody would sit down with like Photoshop or Illustrator and whip out a logo for something in five minutes and have it just be brilliant and beautiful and like, oh my God, yes, I would totally put that on my website. Then I see people spend like days and hours who don't know what they're doing because they were never properly trained and create this thing that's hideous. They're like, you created that? You spent all, oh, okay, great. Now I'm not putting it on my website, right? So that's like a total skill too. But if you have a graphic designer, you have the ability to generate original graphic material and lay out your website in a way that's visually pleasing. There are certain rules of thumb. Just for example, like the one thing I always tell students is put more space around the objects than you think you need because you know what? You need it. Like how good would these words look if they were touching the edge of the, the box? Horrible. But you know what? Web designers do it all the time. They don't think about it. just a little more padding or a little more margin or, you know, a little more line space, whatever it is. Space, size, color, contrast, patterns. You know, there's like these simple little layout rules. Like one, one of them is like the rule of threes. You know, there's all these diff different things. They're learner, learnable skills, and if you get lucky, you get good graphic designers on your team. Ultimately, though, this stuff is technology, so when you start to code, then you're going to find yourself interfacing with your database people and your network people because your software or your website's got to get loaded on a server somewhere. So if we're working here on, at Gateway, right, like we, we work on the Apollo server, which is right across the hall. And Christian is the, the admin of that machine you know, by title. But all of us web instructors also have admin rights. But if we didn't operate that machine, but we're pushing our, our website to it, there's certain things we need to know about it, like what operating system are we running, what services are running, what software is loaded, what versions, you know, all this like stuff. And sometimes you'll have those technicians on your team that will help to configure your servers, give you the, the connections you need to the outside world, will maybe take your web server and, you know, like the one example I was talking about yesterday is like you might have a web server running and then all of a sudden, you know, your company's like putting a Super Bowl ad out and then after that Super Bowl ad runs, you're gonna get like a thousand times the traffic you normally get and they can help you scale the application out so that it can handle the traffic for a few days or weeks or whatever. You know, or like a lot of organizations do this time of year if they're doing e-commerce, they build out their, their services to handle the extra traffic so it doesn't crash. They wanna make the sale, right? It's it, it kinda of like the equivalent of making a bigger store on demand. Uh, you also have to interface with those database people because if you're building real applications, especially when you get to the e-commerce level, all that stuff is database driven. All the images, the, the, the content, the words, the transactions, all of it's stored in a database. You can't be an expert at all of these things, but a project team will involve that. And then somewhere in the mix, you have the guys that actually write the code, right? And it's part of a big you know, part, a cog in the wheel, basically, you know, to get the whole process to go. Like I said, if you freelance at all, you guys, you end up being all of those people. Yeah, that's kind of weird. 
But you know what? Some people thrive on that. So whether you're, you're working on a big project or a small project, what you're going to find uh, is that if you are working on smaller projects, you have smaller project teams, sometimes you'll have people that combine roles. And usually what you do is you let, like, whoever's, like, really good at, like, the networking thing, you let them do the network, you know, you let them configure the server. You let them load the software. Or if somebody's good at the database, you let them do the database stuff. You let people focus on their strengths. Um, I kind of learned how to do a lot of these different things. And, you know, I've had, like, a lot of weird experiences in my life. But one thing I did is a number of freelance projects where I would pull in income and... I would find myself navigating all of these roles, right? And then, the, and then there becomes a discipline that goes with it, right? If you're gonna be a freelancer do, performing all those roles and you gotta like learn some graphic design and learn how to manage the project and learn, learn how to edit an English sentence so it looks good on a website and all those things, you have to learn how to do all of them. And you know what, folks? It's totally learnable and you can make a complete career out of just freelancing on the web plenty of people that do it you can make when you get good at it you can make a lot of money really fast with a minimum of effort it really can be like that or it can be a complete nightmare <laughs> sometimes it depends on your client or what you're trying to accomplish but you know what you're always learning new things and sometimes that's where some of the challenges come in all right so if you're gonna like actually like staff you know a project team you start to look at what people have done. But here's the thing with web, right? If you guys were a software developer, they would probably look more at your resume than anything else. Like so they would say, okay, well, you got your bachelor's degree or your associate's degree and you learned this language, this language, and this language, and you, it looks like you got all A's or B's or C's or whatever. <coughs> all right, and, and you worked at like McDonald's for a while, now you're transitioning to software. All right, you're hired. You know, and then we'll train you the rest of the way. But what happens in the web world, the web world kind of crosses over into the artistic world a little bit. With the web world, you can come in, even without a degree, if you've got a killer portfolio, you've got a couple of really cool links of examples that you've built, you can get the job without, any, without anything on your resume. That's kind of weird. And that happens in graphic design, it happens with video work, like... In the artistic fields, it kind of is that way. If you have the, the killer portfolio or the killer, killer demo or whatever you want to call it, that can get you the gig. So one thing I want you guys to do as you go through your web degree is to create a collection. That's why I have you make a launch page on Kronos, or excuse me, Apollo, because that way you're kind of building a portfolio. So if, you do, if you're smart about it, you put all your classes in separate folders, you link it all up on the front page, and then when you're done with the program, you can just hand people a link to that one page and say, here's an example of all my schoolwork. And you're like, wow, I'm really impressed that you, you saved all this stuff. And you might think your silly little Java assignments or your you know, silly web pages or Java jams are kind of silly, but people can see that you've actually done it. And that's much more important than saying that you've done it. It's proof. And that's what web designers have. What floored me is when I, when I got this job here, right, I could go teach at like a four-year university, for example, teach the same topics. They don't care if I've ever made a web page. As long as I got that master's degree in computer science, you're hired. You, know, you got the academic credentials, right? At Gateway, they would not hire me to teach unless I had significant field experience in exactly the field that I'm going into teach. So that's the one difference with tech school. And, and Brenda, I know that we've, we've talked about that. Um, so what landed me the job here was, well, not, not only the fact that I kind of knew the dean before <laughs> a little bit. I didn't know that walking into the interview. It just kind of happened. But the fact that out of all the applicants, they told me I was the only one that had examples of my web work. Isn't that weird? Right? No, nobody else had like links of stuff that they worked on. I'm like, you're kidding me. How do they call themselves web people? You know, like when Christian came in to interview, and I happened to be on his interview committee, he had like blow away web work. He did some really impressive things. We were like, holy cow, hire this guy. He's brilliant. 
<laughs> he knows what he's doing, you know. Um, so it, it, it really does make uh, a difference. But they look at what you've done in web, portfolio is huge. Some companies, formal education is really important. So I'll give you examples. Like if you try to get a job at Uline, for example, they want a bachelor's degree. They will hire with an associates, by the way. Why? If you've got a killer portfolio <laughs> and pass their psychological profile tests. So formal education is important at some places. So for example, in my, my job, you know, I couldn't get this job without a master's degree. Okay, so that, that's pretty significant, right? Because that, that shows a certain level of commitment to like a certain pathway. IT also has this other aspect, which is the fact that we have industry certifications. They're not really so prevalent in the web world. But on the hardware side of the world, the other side of the hall here, people that are in computer support or networking. So people that are in the computer support program, if they get through the IT essentials class, they're qualified or ready or prepared, I should say, to take what we call the A plus exam. Right? And it, it's an industry certification by a, by a notable uh, organization, CompTIA. And, you know, like all of the techs that work here, Lakita, you can probably verify this, all the ones that are, that are on payroll, that, you know, like full timers, uh, all have to have their A plus certification up to date. Yeah, all the full timers. And then all the people that work in networking services all have to have their networking certification and probably various levels of it. And those are industry certifications. And I'll tell you what, in the old days when I first got into this game and I worked more on the support side than on the development side, uh, and I was working academically, we would, we, you know, you know, we'd sit there and go, oh yeah, it'd be really cool if we could get our, our Microsoft, our, our MCSE, Microsoft Certified System Engineer. Because if you got that certification, boom, you got a job. It was just as simple as that. If you had that, there are 100 companies waiting to hire you. Didn't matter if you didn't even graduate high school. And you know what? I have a few friends that work in IT that did exactly that. They just went and got certified, got their MCSE, showed that they don't know how to work Windows uh, Server and networks. Boom, they got a job. And good jobs. And we're not talking like low-paying jobs. Uh, so it depends on what field you're going into. So some um, portions of IT have certifications that are really important. In web, there are certifications, but they tend to be ignored. They tend to look at your portfolio more than they look at your certifications in web. That's the reality. It's pretty easy to actually go out if you want to get into, if you're curious about getting a certification. If you finish the web one class and the JavaScript class, you can go for what they call the Microsoft MTA certification, which covers basic HTML and JavaScript. Really easy to achieve, it costs students about 100 bucks, and then you have a certification. Will people hire you based on that certification alone? No. <laughs> I, I hate to inform you that. Would they hire you if you had your A plus? More likely if you were a support tech. So in the web world, it doesn't matter so much, but it just depends on, on the discipline you're in. All right. Now, in some circumstances, and they allude to this on the slide, they say that in some cases, sometimes you actually outsource some of the roles of the project team. Now, that's kind of weird. That is kind of weird. Let me give you an example. Like, if you step into a project team, you might go into an organization and you have a bunch of people who are conceptualists, right? And they're like, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if we built an app that blah, 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 you know, mowed my lawn for me or whatever. You know, think of like, just like idea people. And then people that maybe even develop the user interface and create the branding and the logo and the words and the database and all, they have all this stuff, but they don't have a coder. So what do they do? They outsource the coding. They come up with the whole concept and then they hire the, the coders. And this is not unusual. In fact, a lot of firms do this. They will pull people in on contract or hire a separate firm that does the work to actually build the application out. So a lot of times what you'll have is people that will prototype applications, build proof of concept or a basic version, and then they bring in a huge development team or firm to, to do the rest. And that's not uncommon. I did a lot of freelance work. When I was working at the Art Institute, one of the other instructors there, um, he's a, 
he knew how to code, but he was a graphic designer by trade, and we used to do a lot of combo projects. So like he would drum up the work, come up with the visual design, and then he would hand it off to me to code it out. I always loved doing that because I didn't have to think about the fonts, the colors, the layout. It was all done for me. All I had to do was like take that screen and turn it into code. And I'll tell you what, I have some examples of that, and I don't know if I showed that to you guys already. Um, if I did, uh, sorry for the redundancy, but maybe after this is done, I'll, I'll give you, I'll show you some of those examples because I think they're kind of cool. Uh, where I went from concept, you know, to actual working website. Now, the the cycle of working on a project is actually that it is a cycle, and you know, the whole concept of this. Uh, methodology that we're going to talk about and this approach folks is what we call the system development life cycle it is a formalized approach and um, anybody who's stu studied like IT at a higher level typically will have seen this before I'm just zooming in a little bit so we can see uh, all the details on the slide but we usually start the concept of doing website development at the very top of this circle so we we first we think about uh, uh, you know what's lacking or what's needed so like let, you know, let's just hypothetically say you're you're starting a new business whatever kind of business it is you know it's a lawn care business let's just say and you have this idea it's like well yeah we're gonna buy all these lawnmowers and hire these people and we're gonna like mow lawns and it'll be great right we'll put up flyers in the grocery store and we'll get all these customers right but then at some point they'll go you know what wouldn't it be better if we had a website right you know uh, so they have this idea, this conceptualization of what they want to do. And then from there, before you can, you, you can't just go right from like, I'd like a website and hop up on Wix and I have a website, right? You know, well, you kind of can do that, but it's not really going to be like the best type of thing. You really need to sit down, even if you're going to use like Wix to do your website, you still have to analyze, how am I going to do this? What is it going to cost? How much time is it going to take? Who's going to do it? You know, what's involved in all of this? So you, you make an analysis. So we're coming around the circle, right? So you gather up all the things that are required and analyze them and figure out which way are you going to proceed? What are the options and which way am I going to go? Ultimately, you, you're going you're gonna to choose one. You might say, I'm going to build a website myself. I bought an HTML book. <laughs> you know, good luck, you know. Or I, I, I found this website online where all I have to do is pay them some money and boom, I have a website. You know, or whatever, whatever the case may be, you will ultimately make a choice. And when you've made that choice, then you go into the next phase, which is the design aspect. So you start to actually, and now folks, this is not the code. This is the design part of it. You start to get down, to, with the path that you've chosen, you start to get down to the nitty gritty of what it's going to look like what it's going to do, how it's going to behave, what features are available, whatever it happens to be, you, you get that down to specifics. Might even be to the point of creating wireframes. Remember I had you guys do wireframes and sitemaps? And I'll tell you what, when I would do projects, I would start usually with like, all right, let's have a conversation. All right, what do you want the site to do? Okay. And what kind of stuff do you envision on the site? And then you start making lists. And, and what it breaks down to is I'm like, it sounds to me like you need like pages for this, 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 and this. Like I got all these kind of pages that we got to make. Uh, we have, we have to have a photo gallery. We're going to have an online video game. We're going to have a chat mechanism. We're going to have a commerce or, or whatever it is. We figure that all out, specify it, and make a list. We make a site map or a wireframe or all of those things. And I would say that you start typically from creating a list, you move to a sitemap, and then you move to a wireframe or a mockup. And then if you were fortunate, like I was working with that designer guy, where he would kind of take care of all this front end stuff. And then all he, all he would say to me is like, here's the files of what I designed, the client's already approved it, your logo's in there, the pictures are in there, the text is in there. Every specific was provided, and I just would go right to code. I, I loved it, right? But that doesn't come until you get to this phase here. So you have to have the specifics in place first. You can't build what you don't know that you're building. Like, you're not going to just, like, you know, you know, I use the analogy often. It's like, you, you want to build a house. You don't just, like, run up to Menards and buy a bunch of lumber and some nails and a hammer 
and a couple of power tools and drop it off on the site and start like building. Well, maybe you do, right? But chances are you're first going to sit down at the drafting table, figure out how much money you have, do I have the land for it, do I got to pour a slab, do I got to get septic, you know, electric, all this stuff, you got to pour the foundation, and then you got to hire electricians, and well, better yet, don't I need a blueprint, you know, with measurements and, you know, a, a, like some sort of a plan, right, before you get to actually doing it. But when you get to the point of actually doing the work, so creating the content, it might be creating the visuals, creating the graphics, creating the words, creating the code, getting the code to work. If there's like programming logic that sits behind the scene, you have to get all that worked out and you actually do the work. So like most of the stuff that we're doing in this class falls into this one box, most of it. You know, that's the development part of it. We do some of this, you know, we maybe do a little bit of this before we do this, but most of what we do is here. Once you've actually created all that stuff and you're down at the bottom of the circle here, and let's say you, you, your site's just about done, you know, let me give you an example. I have a, a project team right now. So these are a group of fourth semester students about to graduate, and they're building a site right now, and this is the site in progress being built. We're not even done yet, right? They brought this, this is a real organization in Kenosha that had a web presence, that got taken away from them somehow, and now they need a new website. So this is the draft version of the site they're building. And I'm not going to click through, but they've come a long way, right? This looks pretty nice. I mean, they're not even close to done yet. I, I have lots of critiques for them. But they're basically building this. It's a little league for people with challenges, basically, is the, is the way that we... Uh, uh, Call. It's both for children and adults, and they actually have two separate leagues. So really worthy nonprofit organization. Um, and this site, when it's done, we're going to move this out to real hosting, and it's going to be a real website. And they have things built in here where they, for example, like if you wanted to register, they have like a register button, and it brings up a registration form, you know, stuff like that. Um, so pretty imp impressive work. Um, but the point is, once you get the stuff out there, you have to make sure that it works, right? So before you, like, you even bring your client back and say, hey, look at what we made. Isn't this cool? You got to make sure that every part of that website is working the way it needs to work, right? And sometimes you do that internally first. If you're actually writing programming code, sometimes you write programming code that tests your programming code, right? Uh, but you put it through the rigors and, and trials, and then at some point you go into like beta mode, and what uh, beta basically means is where you're kind of releasing it to the public a little bit, and maybe letting your client see it a little bit, and trying it, and fixing, and tweaking it, basically. And once you got all the little bugs worked out, right, then you can go flipping up the circle the other way to the launch. You're actually releasing the website to the public, and people start to use it. Yay, right? Let's make some money, let's sell the product, whatever it is you're doing, whatever your company does, right? And that's a process too, because uh, this, this website that they're working on, as wonderful as it is, right now it still resides on Apollo. See this, it's still on the Apollo server. So the client is at some point gonna purchase what they call web hosting and a domain name. We're gonna talk about those in a little bit. And then we'll take it off of Apollo, because this is a private organization. They can't leave their website here. And they're going to move it up to a web host. So that's, that's a process. So the launching process is we got to port this whole site over, the database, the content, and everything's got to be move, moved over to a publicly accessible server with a real web name on it so the public can see it. So that, that would be launch. So the site would be launched. From there, once it's up and running, there's also the maintenance part of it. So here, here's the thing, whenever you put up a new site, they're never perfect. It's kind of like if you build a house, right? No matter how much care and attention you put into it, there's always like little details you gotta fix, you know? Oh, this word is wrong, there's some new content here, we need an upgrade there, we added these new products, or whatever it is, there's, there's a maintenance phase. You also have to go through the process of doing like security updates to your software, you gotta back up your files on a regular basis just in case you get hacked or crashed or, or whatever. 
So that's something that's ongoing once a, a product is out there and live. When you're in that maintenance phase, you're also kind of doing this. So your site might be out there and functioning and you're maintaining it and it's working, but you know what? It's not really as good as it can be. In fact, you know, our competitors are starting to do this and we're not doing that yet. Or you know what? The interface is starting to look a little antiquated or whatever it happens to be and you have this evaluation phase. So sometimes you'll just hear from your customers. It's like they'll get so peeved at being on your website and having difficulties with it. They're going to write an email or phone call you and say, you know what, your site's great, but I can't find anything and my order got lost and blah, 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 blah. It would be so much better if you just put this on the front page or you know something like that. And then once you go through that evaluation process and your site's been out there running for a while, all of a sudden you're like, well, the site's been great and everything, but I have this idea, right? And well, guess what? Then you're back to the conceptualization phase. That's why it's a circle. And in IT, it's not uncommon for a website to kind of rotate through this process every two to three to five years, it kind of depends. But in, on web, if it's going past five years, it's too long. I would argue because the technology changes that quickly. Really well-designed and well-built websites might even have a longevity that will go out to 10 years. This also applies to application building but you can see how this process is cyclical. Now this is a formalized process in a lot of organizations. In fact, a lot of project teams go through these specific steps in this order to launch a project. However, there are other methodologies and some of them are, are more adept to the modern world. So this is like the old school approach, not that it's not still used, but it is, um, I'd say maybe it's kind of waning in its usefulness in some capacities. Now, the next few slides here kind of step through all the steps that I just talked about, and you can read those on your own. I think I kind of covered all of this already, so I'm just kind of showing you what the specific <laughs> things are that go with each one of those steps. I know you guys can read those on your own, but I just basically lectured all that stuff. All right. Next thing that I'd like to do uh, is before we get to this slide here, I'd like to take a, a five minute break here in class. We'll come back and talk about these topics because I think these are, are pretty important, especially for new web developers. So let's take five and, and uh, come back. Okay, now that we're back from break, uh, we're going to move on to the next section of the, uh, the chapter, which talks about some really important concepts in terms of the web design world and, and doing projects. And that is, you know, when you finally do get your work done, you know, right now you guys are hosting your stuff and that's what it is. When you put your files on Apollo, you're hosting them on Apollo. We give you server space and we give you a way to like upload your stuff. And then once it's uploaded to Apollo, you guys can see it, right? But in order to be able to access a web server online, you need to be able to uh, apply a domain name to the web hosting or the location where your files are stored so that when a user goes to a browser to find you, right, they can type in your web address or do a search on you and find you, basically, and get, and get to your website. What a domain name is, folks, is basically, you know, I don't know, and I'll just type, uh, you know, some website, Coca-Cola. Let's, let's go to Coca-Cola.com. And, and I want you to notice Coca-Cola, their web address. Let's take a look at it really quick. Do you notice it's not like Coca-Cola, it's Coca-Cola? You guys notice that? And I don't know if um, this is still true, but in the old days, the first person to buy Coca-Cola.com was not Coca-Cola. Isn't that weird? Um, and the actually, the person that bought it was a Coca-Cola fan. He was like, wouldn't it be cool to have a website, Coca-Cola.com? So he bought the website name before Coca-Cola did. And to this day, 
Coca-Cola's primary web address is coca-cola.com. Now, like I said, I don't know if like maybe in the, in the aftermath, Coca-Cola actually bought it from him. But in the old days of the internet, it was, there was kind of like this gold rush that happened. People realized that, hey, wait a second, this big company doesn't have that website name, na name yet. I'm going to buy it, and they're going to have to buy it from me. And you know what? It's still a business, but it's not as prevalent as it used to be. But this, what we see on the screen here, this basic thing where you have some words, dot, whatever, that's what we call a domain name. And in the old days, we'd also do this. We'd see how I hit my arrow key? And it says www.coca-cola.com. And that first part of that web address, the www, is what we call a subdomain. It's actually an addition. And in the old days, we used to add that to web addresses because we had more than one way to surf the web in the old days. That's kind of weird, right? There was, there was a time when the web wasn't the primary way to surf the internet. There was actually other technologies that preceded it. For example, there was a technology called Gopher. It was non-graphical, but it kind of did what the web browser does. It would bring up text, and there would be links, and you could go from site to site. But it was a different protocol. It didn't start with HTTP. The prefix was gopher, colon, forward slash, forward slash, and then usually gopher dot whatever dot whatever. It's kind of interesting. That technology, of course, got very quickly replaced by the web and kind of went away. And now, if you actually go out to the web now, people were so nostalgic about Gopher that they actually resurrected it as a format uh, and a protocol. And there's actually like lists of Gopher servers. And this is what Gopher servers would often look like. And I'm, I'm curious if I, if I click here and did that same Gopher trick. Yeah, actually, it doesn't uh, seem to be working on a Gopher protocol. It's actually seemingly it's still a web page. But this is what Gopher servers would look like often, you know. And notice, like, there's, like, these weird, you know, cryptic-looking uh, websites. But you know what? These are all, like, kind of nostalgic. And I'm just wondering if I actually... So this one doesn't work, but notice the web address on it. It, and, and the difference is it doesn't work on HTTP. HTTP stands for, and you should know this because you will be tested on it, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. That's what it stands for. And when you put the S after it, it's secure. It's encrypted, right? And Gopher is its own protocol. It's got a different way of moving the data across the web. And so if I could actually reach this server, and I'm just wondering if any of these are... Um, up and running. It doesn't look like any of them are up and running. You know, the other possibility, and I guess I didn't think about this, is maybe Gopher servers are completely blocked on our network. That's a possibility. But what I what I'm, was hoping to show you is if I could click on any of these and they work. Yeah, none of them work. So I have to believe that they're blocked. Um, is to show you that the code in the, on the back end of it, if you view sources, is different. So it's created a different way. But just to give you an idea. Anyways, going back to the whole domain name thing, I'm actually going to... I'm going to bring up a browser window here, and I'm just going to actually Google domain names. right? And I know where I'm going with this, but um, I'm actually taking us to Wikipedia, believe it or not. Uh, because I think this, they have a great article on, on domain names. Um, but when the internet started out, we only had a limited number of what we call top-level domains. That would be the dot whatever. So dot com, dot net, dot org, dot mil, dot gov. All of those were what we call top-level domains. And when we first started out, we really had a very limited a uh, number of them, and I, I know somewhere here they have, they talk about the top level domains and, and the history of it, and somewhere they have a really cool table, well, okay, maybe this isn't the article I'm thinking about. Um, anyhow, with the top level domains though, um, 
people, there was a little bit of a, like I said, a gold rush. Um, you know, these are the original top level domains right here, the ones that you see here. And it, it, originally some of these required special permission to even buy them. So for example, like .edu, they don't just give that web extension to anybody. You have to actually be an educational institution. And the military has its own. They have .mil. And the government has its own .gov. And you had to be one of those organizations to get it, right? So most commercial companies would typically buy .com, .net, and .org. Um, and .coms quickly got uh, snatched up. Now the way that this works is computers actually work on IP addresses. So I'm bring, bringing up a command prompt, and this is kind of a weird thing to do. But I'm going to do a command that some of you may know. It's called ping. And all this command does is it sends a signal out to a server, and the, the message bounces back. And you notice what I'm pinging here. I'm pinging Yahoo. And the reason I ping Yahoo is because I know they, they leave their, their servers on for this to happen. It's kind of a, a point of example. And so what's happening here is I'm pinging Yahoo. It's going out to their server, and it's coming back with a number. Notice what the number is. 9813724677. Can somebody remember that? Yeah. Nine, what was it? I'm making a point here. 137. See, I, I, don't, I, can't, I can only remember three numbers at a time. 246.7. All right. 246.7. So if I press enter of, on that, Okay, it kind of takes me to Yahoo, but you know, Yahoo's like one of these companies, anyhow, they've always had a ping server out there. Like, a lot of people turn that capability off. They don't want you pinging their server to see if it's there because it's unnecessary network traffic. They just turn that feature off, so if you send a ping request, it goes nowhere. But they have it turned on as a point of example, but it is going to the Yahoo server. But you notice I got to a web page by typing in a number. And the truth is, whatever website you go to, ultimately, you're going to an American IP address. When you type in coca-cola.com, you are really taking that name, you're sending it off to the internet somewhere, and it's getting intercepted by a thing called a domain name server in the domain name system. And that system, there's, there's multiple ones all around the internet, You're, all the internet service providers provide them. It will look up the IP address of the website you're going to and then take you there. So if you don't own a domain name, the only way to get the stuff on the web is by using an IP address. That's not really very convenient, is it? Right? So if you know the IP address, of Apollo, for example, actually that's not a bad one to try. Let's ping Apollo. Ping Apollo.gtc.edu. All right, and that, that, that is responding. So you guys noticing the, the web address on it? 10.11.934. Let's try that one in the browser. 10.11.9.34. Hmm. So what it's telling you is if we didn't have the domain name system, we would have to memorize numbers like that. What a nightmare. Okay, how about a secondary nightmare? Most websites that you visit tend to be on machines where there's other websites too. So that one machine with that one IP address might host a thousand websites. That's kind of crazy to think about. So how is it to know, know, go to the right website? Once again, the domain name system handles that, sends it to the right machine. The machine receives the request and says, which website are you looking for? Oh, Apollo. And, and you go to that machine. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. So a domain name is a way to associate your website with a name that you can understand, hopefully, to a numeric IP address out on the Internet. That's, that's the point of it. Now, domain names are not free. You have to buy them. You know, that, that's another interesting aspect of this. 
You know, so let's go back to the slideshow here. It says, so what does a domain name do? Like if you're building a website, it says it establishes a web presence for your business or organization. So if you are actually going to build a website, so like the clients that we have for that baseball site, one of the first things we did with them is they bought a web name. They went out and they purchased a domain name uh, for the website. And usually if somebody's putting together a new business, or if you're an existing business that already uh, that is looking to get onto the web, that's one of your first steps is you buy the name. And then hopefully you can get the name that matches your company, right? In some cases, it doesn't make sense to use your whole business name. So for Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, you know, that, that works, right? That's, you know, and I'm guessing that if I looked up like Burger King, it's probably BurgerKing.com, probably, you know. Um, but like Gateway Technical College, that's kind of long. That's a lot to type. So they just decided to go gtc.edu, right? So that's something that you, you choose to do. When, when you're shopping um, for a domain name, your, your ideal is always, if you can, especially if you're a company, to get whatever your company name is .com. That's the ideal, right? Unfortunately, you find very often that it's already taken. Other people have, have tried. Uh, to build the same business with the same name somewhere else. I know, I know that when I was helping my parents in the old days with their business website, um, their business name.com was not originally available. Somebody else owned it. So, and their business name was Grecian Imports, right? And so what I had to do as a sideline is like, well, they're incorporated, so we, Grecian Imports Inc.com, that was all that we could get, right? So that's what we did. But then I would sit there and I would monitor, you know, hey, there's no website on this, uh, this web address. Maybe when it comes up for renewal, they won't renew it. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. And I was able, able to grab the name and put our website on there. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but they, they typically say, you know, if you choose a domain name, you should either describe your business Keep it as short as possible. You don't want a domain name that's obnoxiously long or complicated to remember. They say avoid hyphens. Did you hear that, Coca-Cola? <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, some people still use them. Um, they talk about, once again, the top level domains. You know, and there's, there's many top level domains. We're gonna look at that next. But often you, you go through this process of brainstorming to try to find um, stuff that's available that might not be ideal for your organization. So here's what you do, right? If you want to see if you want to buy a name, well, the first thing you do, I guess if I wanted to buy like uh, oldsneakers.com, because I am an old sneaker company. I'm just like, I'm just guessing here. I'm assuming somebody's got a website out there on this. We'll see. And hopefully it's nothing terrible, right? All right. Well, here's one that somebody owns, but look at it. Look, it's available for sale, right? All right, so that's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it is you can go online to a place that either sells domain names um, or whatever, and most of them have a service called Whois attached to it. And Whois is actually a database that's run by ICANN, the organization that doles out all the domain names. There's like one central registry. Thank goodness it's in the US, right? So we have this advantage, of course, right? Most of the internet technology was built here in the United States. So all the languages that drive it are English, right? A lot of the, the servers that drive the whole infrastructure are here in the United States. So we kind of have this like level of control. Although I will tell you that I can, and you see right here, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, I can, um, is uh, actually centralized in North Carolina. And a lot of people don't know this, but the University of North Carolina uh, in the development of the internet was huge. And that's why the database exists there. A few years back, maybe it was only one or two years ago, um, the United States finally gave up control over ICANN. We had exclusive control over the domain name system planet-wide. And they basically said, well, you know, that's kind of unfair. We have a little bit of an advantage. And so they released it to international control, but it's still mostly controlled by the United States, and the core servers are here, still 
here in the state. So what I'm connecting to here is actually a database search for all the web names that are out there and registered. So if I want to see who actually old, owns oldsneakers.com, I just come in here and type it in, hit search. It'll probably ask me to verify that I'm a real human being. I, or, well, I actually didn't, right? And then it pulls back in plain text the record directly from the registry. So this is what's on file with the registry. So they have a domain ID. Okay, the Whois server that pulled back the data. Here's the registrar URL. So whoever owns this already has fabulous.com. The company that, that owns it is fabulous.com. You know, and then notice that <clears throat> that they have a bunch of other information here, and this isn't the entirety of it all, uh, but it seems like this is privatized uh, data. So what that means is this, that you're not really seeing the specifics of who owns it. You're seeing the company. And sometimes when you look up certain web addresses, they, you can privatize your, your listings. If you ever do go out and buy a domain name, what will happen, you know, in fact, we could have some fun with this. Let's look up Gateway. <laughs> Let's look up Gateway and see what that registry is, because that should probably, oh, okay. Dot edu, okay, dot edu is not registered that. All right, somebody give me something else. What, what's a website you want to look up? Well, we know who owns that. That Google. Stuffinmalls.com. There you go. I'm afraid to type that one in. It's a it's a build for your uh, it's a okay. build your own animal workshop, my mom. And it's stuff stuff a bear. Stuff and malls. It's S T U F F N L U V. Dot com. Yep. All right. I'm a little pensive you know, because I'm afraid that's going to be like an adult website with, you know, okay. But we're looking up the registry info. All right. So, yeah, this one is also, well, I can tell where it's hosted. It's hosted on Wix, right? I can just tell from their name server. Um, but it looks like some of their registry stuff is, is also blocked on this one. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to actually go directly to the Whois uh, database because you can get directly to it. So this is the core one that all of them pull from. And I'm just trying to think of like maybe a smaller company that we can look up. Um, I don't know. Um, here, I'm going to... All right, so I'm... looking and what I'm trying to show you is an example like when you register sites if you don't uh, choose to privatize your information when you buy your domain name your your name your phone number your email address and your street address are publicly visible in this registry so if you guys ever buy a domain name you take that step and you buy a domain name and can I give you guys a tip if you guys are becoming web developers, you should buy your own domain name and you should buy your own web hosting so that you have a real web environment to try out your stuff. More real than Apollo, right? We give you Apollo for free, but when you go out into the work world and you're building real websites, you're gonna have to do this stuff all the time. Um, but if you do ever buy your own domain name, choose the privacy option, even if it costs a few extra bucks a year, because otherwise what will happen is there's people that troll this stuff and then all of a sudden you're getting spammed to your email account you never got before. How did it get here? Uh, and it's all because you're publicly visible in the registry. Now, I'm, I'm like one of these um, like weirdos, right? That I'm like, well, you know what? I better buy like my own name.com just in case. You know, I ever become famous and I, I can own my own domain, you know, but now I just use it to host a silly website. But I'm just curious to see, is mine privatized? Yeah, it looks like mine is privatized too. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I did privatize. I don't want people looking me up and figuring out where I, where I live and, you know, all that. Although, I guess I put that up on screen last week, so. <laughs> so there, I blew that one. Um, but that's kind of interesting because you can look up who owns the site. The other thing that you can look at 
is when the expiration date is for it. So look like, like I've registered mine out to 2024, right? Most domain name registrations, when you buy them, are recurring annual costs. So most people opt to just buy it for one year and then every year it renews. And depending on who your registrar is, sometimes you can set it up to be an automatic renewal. Sometimes um, you have to go in each year and pay for it. it. Just depends on what kind of setup you get. Some registrars will allow you um, to prepay for 10 years, for example, to hold the name. And if you're really serious about keeping that name, that you probably should do that. Sometimes you get a little bit of a discount for it, usually not much. There is a game that a lot of these companies do play though, and you should know this. Some, some of them will offer you free hosting if you buy a domain name, or a free domain name if you buy hosting. You know, they, they play these little games, but a lot of the prices that you see initially when you buy this stuff are, are what we call loss leader pricing. Anything to get you in, and then once you got the in, then the next year the real bill comes. So the first year you're paying 20 bucks, and the next year it's like 150, and you're wondering why. Um, you know, there's things like that. So uh, if you do go out there and start choosing uh, domain names, you need to be aware of this. You don't have to stick with top level um, domains that are like the original ones. Uh, so a number of years ago, they, they started figuring out, you know what, we are running out of top-level domains. And, okay, so this is actually tracking them. Um, and so what they started to do, and I don't know if they're going to list them here. I, I, okay, so I guess they have these articles like broken down into like more and more detail now. Um, so let's see if they have, here, just go to top-level domains, right? So the top level domains started to run out when they had the .com, .mil, .gov, .edu. And so what they did is the first thing they did to expand it was they added, okay, and I'm not seeing any of it here. Holy cow. All right, any, anyhow, uh, country code top level domains, that's where we want to go. The first thing they did is they decided, well, Maybe we should have a top level domain for all the different countries on the planet. So they did that. See, and I'm trying to find the lists, and, and I don't know why I'm struggling so much to find them. Here we go. So here's a list of top level domains. So what they decided to do a number of years back when they were running out of web addresses is they said, well, why don't we create a two letter top level domain for every country on the planet? So every country, every official country, I think there's 178 countries or something like that, each have their own top-level two-letter extension. So for example, for the United States, it's .us. For England, it's .uk. For Germany, it's .de. For China, it's .cn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now there's some countries, uh, and one of the, the more famous ones, and I, I forget the name of the country, but they have the top letter, top level domain of dot TV, right? Tuvalu, right? So apparently it's like a British protectorate or something. But what's fascinating about them is it's a tiny, tiny little island. You know, probably like 10 square miles or something like that. And one of the ways they, they fund their country is they sell this domain extension to people. And so a lot of TV stations or television networks like to have dot TV you know, as their thing. And it was like a big thing for a long time and it's kind of, I think, kind of faded a little bit now. But those are country top level domains. But they also have what they call, let's see, list of custom top level domain. All right. All right, now this is, this is a little mind-boggling because this is just a text file dump. All right, so as a result of still running out of web addresses, a number of years back, they created a new thing where you can go in, and if you have enough money, right, and this here's a catch, right, if you have enough money, you can create your own top-level domain that's completely custom. And what you're seeing here is all the ones that have ever been created. 
So you guys, like, have you ever gone to the new Bucks Arena, the Fiserv Forum? Do you guys know what their web address says? It's Fiserv.forum. Not .com. Yeah, and it's even not, it's on the building that way. Um, you know, so here's a list. So chances are, whatever it is you're into, there's a top-level domain that matches it. Isn't that wild? So the mindset of like, I have to get whatever.com, those days are dead. Nobody cares. Because now what people do is when they look up a website, I, notice I didn't type Coca-Cola.com. I did a search. I, did, I typed Coca-Cola, and I let Google it find it for me. Right? So that's how a lot of people operate. Very few people type real web addresses anymore. They let Google do the work for them. But if you're, if you're in this approach of buying a name, like I had one student group that did, once again, a project website. So this was created by Gateway students a couple years back. They, there's a lady up in Mequon, she's starting a new like restaurant deli kind of thing. And she wanted to buy, her business is called On The Way Cafe. So she wanted to buy onthewaycafe.com, of course, which somebody already had, of course, right? That's kind of how it goes. And so at the time, these custom top-level domains were brand new, and it, it was a really hard sell, I, and I'm the one who sold her on it, right? So I, I said, you know what? This is the way of the future. It, it doesn't seem like you know people will use it this way, but they totally will, you know? And I, it, it was a hard sell, but I'm glad we convinced her because she was able to get onthewaycafe. So she still got her name in there, right? And, and this is the site that they built. So the students helped her, uh, helped her buy the name. They also built the website for her, uh, assuming it still works, right? Because I haven't looked at it in a while. <laughs> you know, all right, and, that, and that's actually the lady right there. That's a picture of her. So they, my students built this website. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, it's really, it, it is really, really nice. And, and she sells like all like organic kind of custom kind of foods and stuff. You can kind of look at it yourself if you wish. But uh, really beautiful looking website um, for a real business, right? So wouldn't you hire the person that made this, right? So when you guys get to the end of your program, you get into that project class, we're going to get you working on this level, folks. And then you'll have that link to put in your resume that people will go, okay, wow, well, hire this person, right? That's, that's kind of the whole uh, thing, all right? But that's an example of a custom top-level domain. So if you guys are shopping for domain names, there's a lot of places to shop for. You want to just Google domain names? Oh my, you get so many, there's like probably a million websites that sell them. The probably the biggest seller of domain names is GoDaddy. I don't know if that's still the case, but you know how big they are. They advertise like, like on TV, you know, they're, they're huge. Yeah, it, 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 it's pretty huge. Um, Google also sells domain names, and I know a number of people that are switching over to them. So if you just Google Google domains, and I guess it's, and, and check out their top level domain. Their top level domain is domains.google. So Google created their own uh, extension, right? Um, so that's another place they can go to buy them. And I'm not trying to promote any one company. There's a lot of companies that do these services, okay? Um, I have certain ones that I use all the time, and, you know, and I, I might put some of those up on the screen. But if you click through to any of these, they'll all give you different pricing schemes. A lot of them truly really kind of, I think, kind of scam you into starting business with them. Or you go to like a site like Wix or Squarespace, and their game is they give you a free website. But then if you want your own domain name, that's when you pay. Right? And then the monthly fees kick in. Right? Um, all right, let's, let's move on the PowerPoint and then I'm, I'm gonna kind of like pull this together. So they, they recommend a couple of different places. The first one that you see, register.com, was originally the ICANN organization that started the whole thing. And then they kind of branched off into this company called Network Solutions. So two of the big early registrars and I did business with both of those. I think both of them are very expensive. I don't know if it's still the case. And then Go, GoDaddy came out and they were kind of like cut rate and kind of undercut a lot of them. But there's many, 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 many registrars out there just to buy the domain name. Now the thing is, if you do buy a domain name, you have to know this. Just because you bought the name doesn't mean you have a place to FTP your files, folks. 
That's a separate service. In most cases, when you buy a domain name, you typically choose to buy the hosting from the same place because it's all under one roof, it's one bill. Okay, And I do recommend that. It just makes it a little bit easier to manage. I do have a number of websites that I own over the years and with different registrars. And uh, I, over the years, I've been kind of consolidating all, all the domain names and hosting over to a, one different company. But even to this day, I buy my domain names in one place and I do my hosting somewhere else. I've been with the same web host. Um, and the one that you know I use I mean, um, is this one. And I'm not sure why I chose them way back when. Maybe it was pricing, maybe it was features, but I use this company. And I've been using them for 20 years plus. And I, I do a, what they call a business level hosting. And I think that's what I pay. I think it's, I think it's 10 bucks a month. Comes up to like $120 a year. No, it's not bad. That's just hosting though. This is the place to put your files. But notice, I can have unlimited domains, unlimited disk space, unlimited transfer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can load up as many websites as I want. They don't care. And why would I have a service like this? Because if I'm doing work for people, making websites, one of my side businesses is selling them web hosting. So wait, I'm buying the web hosting and selling it to somebody else? You got it. And I learned that when the, the hard way because what I used to do is I used to pull in clients and they'd be like, okay, well now that we need to host it, where are we going to go? And I'm like, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> and see, the beauty of it is, you know, I also have this other front end. So I, this, this first website that I pulled up, this is actually me. Just so you guys know. WebZoe.net is is my uh, company and you can come here and you can buy your domain names and your hosting and all sorts of stuff right you, and you don't have to patronize me I'm just giving you an idea and the reason I did this is because I was doing so many projects and then people would be like well I need to I need domain names and hosting I'm like well I can sell it to you the same price as GoDaddy you know maybe cheaper you know what and every time they go in and renew I get a little piece of it it's not a lot but it pays for itself every year. And sometimes, you know, I've been, I've been surprised. I've had some really good months this year where I'll like go to my bank account and I'm like, well, it's 500 bucks in the account or whatever. I'm like, right on, this is, I didn't do anything. All I do is put the website up and pay for it and it's boom, it's like making me money. And as a web designer, those are the kind of things you look for, for like, you know, revenue streams. So if I was like actively pursuing this and really pushing it, I might be able to grow it to something much bigger. So for example, if I'm looking for web hosting, there are some really big hosting companies you guys need to know about, all right? So for example, here's, um, here's some of the real big ones. There's HostGator, all right? Now HostGator, I bring this one up because this company here, one of the bigger ones that's out there, is, was started in Wisconsin. Uh, in fact, very similar to my story, a web teacher at, dub, at MATC in Milwaukee started this as a side thing and he grew it into a monster, right? And maybe if I was a little bit more ambitious, I could kind of do the same thing. Maybe I should, you know, uh, but I, I don't even promote mine. You know, the, the only business I get is, you know, kind of word of mouth and like past clients that keep renewing. Um, although I've thought about pushing it. So HostGator is a big one. Another one, big one is uh, Bluehost. Bluehost is a real big one. Right. You see all of them will have their weird loss leader pricing, whatever. Uh, here's another one, oneandone.com. They're really, really, really big, too. Uh, I already showed you GoDaddy, right? GoDaddy is probably the biggest of all of them. I, I'm not sure how they got to be so big and, and, and so powerful. Um, but whatever it is they did, they captured first the domain name business because they were undercutting the original uh, ICANN businesses that came out. Um, and then they got into uh, hosting. Um, so you, you go through them, you buy, buy your domain name. So, I mean, just procedurally, you come in here and let's say you want to buy, I don't know, whatever.com, right? I want, that's my business, whatever.com. And they come in here and they say, well, that's taken. And then they give you, here, well, here's some other examples. How about whatever online? 
or <laughs> you know what, whatever whatever you know um, yeah maybe there's a whatever top level I mean I don't even know you know but they give you all these examples and some of them are pretty affordable but you see some of these with the really high price tags on them those are like you're buying it from somebody else already owns it that's why it's so uh, high priced but what you look for is the ones that are affordable that make sense and it takes a, it's a little bit of a process until you find a domain name that's really right for your business everybody still prefers dot com folks so if you can get a dot com address for whatever business you have kudos you know if you can't don't be afraid of other top level domains people don't care anymore honestly but buy a name that makes sense when when I look at like uh, you know the one that I run here right so 1699 but you always look there's always an asterisk it's like okay so that so what's really the price then right so if I looked up that same thing here whatever you know I'm not even putting a dot com or anything after it let's see what it comes up with whatever.com is taken it's, it's assumed that that's what you're looking for but they start giving examples here some of these are resale right look at the prices really expensive um, but some of them are not so like if I wanted, I don't know, whateverfamily.com or whatever PL, I don't know what that's for, or whatever dot site, okay, that one looks like it's a, it's a resale. But you'll, you'll get the impression here that you get whatever price, and typically that price is an annual recurring amount. In some cases, if you buy a website, uh, websites, and you want to host it, and then there, of course, there's different kinds of hosting. Um, hosting, then actually that is usually billed on a monthly basis, or if you're smart, you buy it on an annual basis and you get like a 10 to 20% discount typically. Um, but you can see that it does not cost that much to get hosting. Notice though that there's different price levels. So you can get hosting for as cheap as 250 a month. That's not a starter rate, by the, by the way. That's a, that's a monthly fee. That's really cheap, right? So you pay like 20 bucks a year for a, a name, 250 a month for space. I can load one website. I got 30 gigs of storage and as much bandwidth as I need. If I scale it up a little bit, they give me more space. They give me email accounts and databases, right? But usually you want, you know, like if you're like a serious professional, you usually want to get up to these levels. And this is the kind of level that I operate on. So I have it so I have unlimited websites, unlimited everything. And it gives me significant flexibility. So like if I undertake a project, you know, I have plenty of spots to put it. Before um, I worked at a place like Gateway where we have like web servers on site, I used to teach classes like this and I would teach at schools that didn't have web servers. So I would just host the students on my own servers. I would create FTP accounts on my own servers because I thought it was so important that they get a flavor of what it's really to like to work on the web. There are different types of hosting too. So the other thing that you should know is that hosting typically falls into two categories. You have hosting for Linux, which is what Apollo is, and hosting for Windows. So the Windows operating system has its own web server software and usually you know, some websites will say Linux hosting or Windows hosting. Here, it's kind of broken down into cPanel or Plesk, and those are really the control mechanism. But if you are building anything that's Windows, Windows web hosting, that's what it is, and that hosts different sets of technologies. So if you have an ASP.NET website or running Microsoft databases or Microsoft applications on the back end, you usually go with Plesk hosting. It tends to be a little bit more expensive because the servers are a little harder to operate. But the interesting thing is, is that the Linux-based hosting usually has this control panel interface uh, called cPanel. And the Windows-based hosting usually has the Plesk interface for hosting too. Now what those hosting control panels do is they give you a way to control your account like you guys don't have a control panel for Apollo. All you can really do is upload. Your control panel is the command line. We don't want you having anything more on that system. 
But on a system like this, if you log in, I'm going to give you an example. I don't usually show this to my students, but like for example, if I log into my web host, this is their control panel. It's not cPanel, it's a custom one, but this gives me access to all the features of my web hosting. All the websites that are loaded, all the files, the databases, applications, I can monitor network traffic, I can see my IP addresses, my domain name servers, I mean, you see all the information here. Um, it's, it's pretty granular and intense, you know, I mean, I can control every aspect of my website from here um, completely. In all the hosting services that you buy, typically they'll use the cPanel product that gives you access to all the same things. Um, so that is a, is a monthly recurring fee, but whatever you guys do to basically host a website, it really kind of comes down to you in, in terms of what decisions you make, how much money you want to spend, but this is my general rule of thumb for people. Usually a domain name, if you're buying one that's not pre-owned, will run you about 20 bucks a year. You can get them cheaper and much more expensive. Shop around. You might go to my website and get it for $15 a year. You might go to Google and get it for 12 bucks a year and then go to another place. But then it's all the add-ons that cost you money. So for example, one, one reason I know a lot of people are going to Google is because if you buy one from Google, they give you the privacy option free, right? If you buy it from me, it's like an extra five bucks a year, I think. That's so that people can't see your name and e email address and stuff. Um, so, you know, and I'm not trying to pitch their services, I'm just telling you shop around. But Google does not sell hosting, that's kind of interesting. What, uh, you know, and, and that's kind of like a big aspect of the business. So like if you uh, look at, um, is this GoDaddy? Yep. So if you go to GoDaddy, and let's say we look at their hosting, and let's look at web hosting, and they give you some comparison. You can just see like comparisons in pricing. And you know what? GoDaddy's always got the stuff on sale for new customers. <laughs> Not for old customers, new customers, right? Because they, what they want to do is they want to get you on the hook, right? So like the price that you're seeing here, this is on sale, save 23%. So it's as low as $12.99 a month. It doesn't mean that's what the price is, right? You really have to kind of dig into the details. It's whatever the price is the second year that the real price is, or the third year. Um, so often what they do is they give you the loss leader pricing, they bundle in features, they, then they try to get you to buy all this extra stuff, often stuff you don't need. I do strongly recommend that you always have privacy for domain names. And usually economy level hosting is best for most people, especially for single websites. The, the real cost of this kind of stuff, folks, 20 bucks a year for a domain name is a, is a good guess, and usually about 10 bucks a month for hosting. That's what I would allot. Total that up, it's about 120 bucks a year to have a website out on the internet. It's a drop in the bucket, really. In the old days, we used to pay like 120 bucks a month for a Yellow Pages ad that was like a little tiny little thing and like nobody would ever call. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I remember running my business and I'd get calls from like AT&T. It's like, hey, you have Yellow Pages ad. I'm like, I don't want an ad. What do you mean you don't want an ad? It drives business. And I'm like, nobody calls. <laughs> Only people that call are spammers, you know. Um, and nobody's looking at the ad. In fact, do you guys even get phone books anymore? You, you, you know what I mean? So it, that's how much it's changed. Um, but yeah, you used to pay big, big money because, you know, and people would get these big ads because they knew that if the only way they can look you up is in the phone book and they find the big ad, they call the big ad first, the one that's got color and the big phone number and whatever, you know. Um, and, and those days have changed. So this is a really affordable way for a business to promote itself is to buy a domain name. And this is considered a given now when you, when you do any sort of business. Um, so I, I'll encourage you guys that if you're serious about doing this, consider buying yourself a domain name and consider buying yourself hosting. If you don't want to pay for hosting and you don't want to pay for a domain name and you want to experiment but you don't want to work on Apollo, I'm going to give you a great tip, all right? I'm not going to call this a million dollar tip, but it's maybe a hundred dollar tip. And there's, there's some uh, sites and here's one of them. This, students turned me on to this one, right? I had a couple students 
in one of my classes that said, oh yeah, we use X10 hosting, right? No, catching the price on this, free and unlimited. There's always catches though, right? So if you use this service, the way they make their money is whatever website you set up on here, whatever hosting, it's going to be a subdomain. So you're going to, let's say it's like lakita.x10hosting.com, right? But then if you want to put a real domain name on it, you got to pay them and that's where they make their money, right? And then it'll cost a little bit more than what you might get at somewhere else. So it might be like 30 bucks a year for the domain name, but you still get the hosting for free. The way they keep the hosting free is this. You have to log into the control panel at least once a month. And if you don't, they turn the account off. However, it is completely free and you can load up WordPress and all these other applications on it. You can throw your files up there just to goof around. If you don't want to do it on Apollo, you want to do it here. You want to build a portfolio site that doesn't disappear after you stop being a student. You know, by the way, we don't, we don't delete accounts on Apollo, but we can't always guarantee it's going to be up and running into the future, right? Uh, so you might want to have some sort of hosting. So this is a great free option to goof around with. I played around with it a little bit. Um, you know, what happens to me is I always forget to log in every 30 days and then it goes away. <laughs> but whatever. They send you reminder emails. It's just another task to perform. But I think it's kind of a small task, really, considering it's free. So experiment, you know, and uh, check it out. And, you know, th there's no harm done. But you owe it to yourself if you're serious about doing this to buy a domain name and get some hosting of some sort that's for real and start goofing around. Maybe you can even turn it into some money. You know, who knows? All sorts of things can happen. Um, next thing. Um, let's talk about the types of web hosting that are out there. So. Most of the, the hosting prices that we were just looking at are attributed to a style of hosting called virtual hosting. So that's what this means. That means the service that you're buying, you're connecting your website to one particular server. So if you think about Apollo, for example, which is across the hall, it's one machine. And loaded on that one machine, we probably have now about 1,000 accounts. So potentially a thousand websites are running off of that one machine across the hall. That's kind of mind boggling, right? And that's how virtual hosting works. It's one machine with one IP address that once it receives a request for a website, finds that folder that holds that website and takes you to it. So often when you get virtual hosting, uh, some people, uh, call, what else do they call it? Uh, shared hosting is often what they call it. Virtual or shared hosting. It means that it's not one dedicated computer. It's one computer that's running a lot of websites. And you, you know, frankly, folks, that's all most people need. Even big companies, that's typically all they need. When you get beyond that is when you really have a significant number of files, pages, and applications that are running on the website, and you really need the horsepower. And if you're doing that, um, then you start looking at some of these other types of hosting. So you can actually do hosting where it's the dedicated server. That means that one machine belongs to you. You're the only website on that machine, and that's it. And you know what? I was one of those uh, weirdos in the old days when I started to do this. I thought, you know what? I know how to build servers. I know how to load up a web server and whatever. And so I, I actually used to run the machine that I, I would do like client work. And I, I ran the machine where the websites were hosted. Right? I got out of that game really quick because you know I, I realized it's like, well, I gotta do upgrades, I gotta do patches, I gotta do backups, I gotta have a ba battery backup, I got I gotta have like a, a high upload speed, because like most of our internet connections, it's really fast down but really slow up. When you have a web server, it's gotta be really fast up and really slow down, it's the other way around, or at least synchronous. Uh, and I got out of that game real quick because I started like calculating how much time I have to buy the computer, have to upgrade them, you know, all the, all the costs that go with it. You know, if it goes down in the middle of the night, I got to get it back up, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, like, I'm like, well, 10 bucks a month sounds like a fair trade to me, <laughs> you know, and I can do all the same stuff. So it really becomes kind of silly to run your own web server when you can just pay somebody a monthly fee and it's always working and great. You can also kind of ramp it up 
um, to like higher levels. So you can do co-located servers. So instead of your web server being in one spot on the internet, it's in multiple spots. So what happens is bomb drops on spot A, spot B kicks in. Or if the person searching for your site is in New York, they hit the East Coast server. And if they're in LA, they hit the West Coast server, even though they're running the exact same websites and they're replicated. That's kind of an interesting uh, approach. You know, we already talked about this, dedicated web server. And you know what? Um, you know, I think I already talked about all this stuff. You know, if you're gonna choose hosting, some considerations is not a bad uh, checklist. Um, and the big thing for me is, what if you have a problem? So whatever hosting service or company you choose, what happens when things go wrong? And I, I'll tell you what, things will go wrong. Sorry folks, it just, it just happens. Servers go down, things get hacked, you know, communications get cut, whatever the, the, the situation is. Um, and then you look at like things like, what kind of tech support do they have? Is it 24-7? You know, is it a local phone number, you know, or is it like some cryptic, like send an email and do you get a response? Are you really, are you chatting with like a virtual agent instead of a real, you know, that kind of thing. The one thing that I do like about the host that I've been using for like 20 years plus now is that when I do have a problem, they have a super responsive support team and they're really quick to escalate the tickets. So like I actually had an issue over the summer uh, where I had to like migrate from one server to another and they helped me through the process and they made it really smooth. I mean, I can't say enough about, you know, positive things about how helpful they were. Always an open line of communication. If I wanted to pick up the phone, I can pick up the phone. There's plenty of like hosting companies where you, you, you can't call them. You know how frustrating that is? You want to like call and just say, I want to give you a piece of my mind and you can't even call them to do that. You know, because, you know, the complaint emails just go into the complaint folder, which goes straight into the trash, typically, right? But not with the smart companies. Actually, the, what the smart companies do is they value those complaints more than their compliments. Honestly, you know, they use that as a point for learning. Um, so you got to think about all these things. Most of the web, you know, if you're shopping around, most of we're going to say 99.9% .9 uptime and all, this, all these, like, catchphrases. Um, but I can tell you from experience, you know, probably over the 20 years, I have had outages, but they've been very minimal. And here's the other reality. There are really very few people that do web hosting. All the web hosts buy their services from other web hosts. Okay. Th that should be kind of like a mind blown kind of thing. You know who's biggest in web hosting? Guess. Just make a guess. Bingo. Amazon, right? Okay. Amazon is this. Amazon is the world's biggest retailer. They make Walmart look like mom and pop on Main Street in terms of like the amount of sales they do retail. And we, when we think of Amazon, we might think of like the stuff you buy from them. And, and some of you might think of like, well, I also, I also stream video and buy music from them or whatever. But their number one business thing is Amazon Web Services. When they build out their company, they way overbuilt their server infrastructure to the point where they started to make more money by selling their server space to other companies. So a lot of companies, when they are scaling up their applications and their websites and they're real, they put it on Amazon Web Services. Because if they need to grow it, they just allocate more resources. And why Amazon? Because they have more servers and more server farms than anybody else on the planet, period. They're, they do more of their revenue from selling their web services than they do retail. And remember, the retail com component <laughs> makes Walmart look like a mom and pop. It, it's a mind-blowing thing. So a lot of these big hosting companies I showed you are running on top of the Amazon infrastructure. So they're buying their hosting from Amazon and then selling it to you. Just like I'm buying it from somebody and selling it to you. There's nothing wrong with that. That's how business is done. You know, and somebody's got to make that money. 
right? So it's just a matter of getting the clients to pay for it. Does that mean it's bad just because you're buying it from somebody who's buying it from somebody who's buying it from somebody? Not necessarily. It's just how it's done. All right. All right, this is kind of a weird chapter, but it's a really important one. So um, we're, uh, we're done with it, and we're going to take a break again, and then we're going to come back and talk about some other things.